several of them said to me things like, you Westerners are so naive, you're being propagated. This was in 1990, 91. You are being propagandized and you don't even realize it. And one fellow who, who I really liked, Hans Peter, he, I said, well, tell me more. And he said, well, it's so obvious to us because we knew we were being propagandized and we developed this antenna to sense it. And you, you Westerners are so gullible and you believe these things. And so here we are today, Putin is evil. Uh, I, I know very few people here in America I can have a conversation with about Russia. Hello, everybody. This is Pascal, and today I've got me Dan Bednars, who wrote a very interesting book titled East German Intellectuals and the Unification of Germany, an Ethnographic View. This book is quite cool to me for four reasons. First, usually it's the Europeans who go out into the world and then do ethnographic and anthropological studies of the non-whites to understand how they function and what they do. And here we've got an American who does this to the Germans. So it's an outsider view of East and a little bit also West Germany trying to understand these groups. Secondly, the book does something you don't read or see often in German publishing landscape. It takes the East German experience serious, especially that of intellectuals who witnessed what was happening to their Germany during the reunification process in the 1990s. And they witnessed that very ambivalently, as he shows. Um, third, it also is a very interesting long-term study because Dan first observed Germany right before the wall fell, then talked to these East German intellectuals, and then came back in 2014 to follow up with them 24 years later. And finally, the book links up with today, where we clearly see different electoral preferences in Germany, where the AFD is most strong in East Germany, and East Germans also seem to be way more critical of media narratives. So today we want to do a little bit of outsider Germanology together. Dan, lovely to meet you, and thanks for coming online. Well, thank you. Uh, I always like talking about myself, so <laughs> but I'll try and talk about the East Germans. So yes, it's it's wonderful to be speaking with you about this, paying tribute and, to them as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, and just before we started, you just told me that you're happy that you were able to contribute this study because you do think it matters. I mean, all of us who publish books, we think it, things matter. And I, I I was very surprised when I read it because it doesn't often, often happen that somebody takes East Germany serious, but this is very yeah. important. It yes. this was a state that was, a la that was around for 40 years and then vanished. Yeah. Uh, it was, and we will go into this, the Germany, of course, it's called reunification, but it was not really a reunification. Yeah. It was a takeover. It's, it's East Germany, it's West yes. Germany that took over the East. So how did this project start? What brought you to Germany in the first place? Okay. Uh, in 1990, uh, I went there with uh, my family, my wife, who's an academic, and my two children. Uh, my wife had an appointment at the Wetzet Bay, Wissenschaftszentrum Berlin. Uh, it was her sabbatical year, and they were kind enough to also give me an appointment, more or less as a courtesy. But they said, do, do what you want to do to study, as a study. Uh, I was going to study the introduction of personal computers in German industry, how that would affect hierarchies and power relationships. But the first day I was in Berlin, when we arrived, uh, I was asked to go to the Academy of Sciences in East Berlin, which was gonna, East Berlin would was going, it was in its final five weeks of existence. I was asked to fill in for an American and, they, and the American said, they just want someone to speak English. And so I spoke with someone on the phone and I said, what do you want me to do? And he said, oh, well, uh, we're just happy to have you, Professor, blah, blah. And then he said, we'd like to talk about race relationships in America. And I said, fine. And I went there and talked to this class and we had a wonderful time. And from there, I was invited back for the next semester, the next and final semester. And people kept inviting me out for coffee and a beer or whatever. And they would say things like, we're tired of talking to each other. We cannot talk to the West Germans because they revile us. 
and simply don't understand us. And we are so happy that uh, someone from the West will listen to us. And plus, we want to work on our English, <laughs> uh, practice our English. So that's, and, and I tried to find someone, uh, I went to the Vaitset Bay and tried to find academics. I asked my academic colleagues there, well, there must be people studying these intellectuals because their system's coming to an end. It's, it's a natural experiment. They said, no, no, no one is. You have to understand that West Germans can't, especially West German academics, really can't talk to East German academics. And then I learned about the hostility among West Germans toward East German academics. And so after about three or four weeks, I thought, well, I'm going to do this. And I started the study. And for the next year, or actually, I interviewed over 100 people formally, talked to dozens of people informally. Um, and so that's how the study uh, got started. And I, you're right, I was an outsider uh, coming in. Uh, there are advantages and disadvantages to that, that of course. But coming as, in as an outsider, the East Germans would often say to me, you ask questions a West German would never ask and we'd never ask ourselves. Or they would say, oh, I want you to speak to my friend. Um, you know, and, and, and so it was a snowball methodology. Mm -hmm. And of course, there were issues about, is this man Professor Bednars from the CIA? That sort of thing. Um, there were a few people in each class who wouldn't even say hello to me or look at me but most of them were very friendly. Uh, the teacher of the class, uh, we became good friends, and she assured the students who were actually grown adults uh, from a variety of scientific disciplines, she assured them that I was not a spy. Um, and then after I would interview them, they would say things like, you didn't ask me the questions I would think someone from the CIA would ask me. You actually let me tell my story. Uh, I had a formal questionnaire to begin, but I soon realized that was going to get me nowhere. Uh, they, the level of trauma, the level of shock, culture shock, uh, was such that uh, I had to go with the flow and listen to them and try and get the information I wanted from them, just person to person, each interview. And uh, that was easy to do because what I wanted to do was tell their story. And in my life, I've always sided with the underdogs. That's, that's what I do, just a natural inclination. Um, and people would say, oh, do you want to speak to da da da? He was a vice president, he was this, I'd say, well, you know, if he wants to talk to me, but the real story is with the people, the common uh, people. And there were, you know, good, good professors and interesting people in the academy and at Humboldt, but I didn't want party line. I wanted real people who were experiencing real uh, culture shock as, you know, the end of socialism, the end of their country. And so that's how it began. And then it just kept going. Uh, and I, I don't know, I had a lot of fun doing it <laughs> and met a lot of interesting people. Um, there were a few West German colleagues who were supportive, and there were quite a few who were really derisive. Um, uh, and, and I don't know if you want to know about the publishing of the book, uh, why it took so long. Well, in, in 1992, when I returned to America, uh, I contacted all the academic publishers. They said, what do, we want to, what do we want a book about these people for? Really? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, um, there's no interest here. And then when the 25th, and, and I wrote the book without the second wave of, I wrote up all the interviews without the second wave of uh, interviews. And my wife said uh, in 2013, I know you love Germany. I know you love being there. 
I want you to take me there between semesters. We're going in January 2014. And I went back and I pulled out the manuscript and then I had seven publishers who wanted the book. Um, and I chose one, very good publisher of books on Europe. I wrote, and then I went back in, in 2014 and interviewed one fourth of all the people. I was able to find about 28 people uh, and uh, finished the book and submitted it. And I got four reviews. Three of them said, publish the book. One of them said, uh, and I think I'm almost quoting verbatim, he said, I can't believe this Bednar's fellow actually believed what these East Germans told him. Uh, I strongly oppose the publication of this book. And the publisher wrote to me and said, well, I'm, I'm rejecting the book. I can't afford to have to publish a book like this. And I wrote back to her and I said, well, of course, I'm disappointed, but I'm doubly disappointed that you told this person my name because this review was supposed to be anonymous. That yes. was, that's the, the conditions under which I entered into this. And I said, but thanks for considering it. And then I went and, and uh, I just found Palgrave Macmillan and submitted it to them. And there's a little bit of a story, but basically they said, we want this book. And, and, <laughs> and, and just to be clear, Palgrave Macmillan is a very good uh, academic publisher. Uh, oh, yeah. They, they produce wonderful books, a lot of them. Well, we they, use they, them on a daily basis. Yeah. Yes. And they were just re one of the reasons they chose the book, perhaps the primary reason, is they were just starting a series on European intellectual history. Mm -hmm. And they told me mine was one of the first books they were going to publish. And, and you know, this this story links up very well with today because what we yes. are seeing at the time, it, the early 1990s or the mid 90s were, were a period of blatant triumphalism. So nobody yes. would be interested in what the losing party is all about. And then yeah. and, and and today this is this is changing a bit, but we still have this idea that the wrong story must not be told. So that's what happened to you. And let's go into this story. Okay, you interviewed, right. in that case, about 100 people, huh? Yeah, over um, 100 formally, and I met dozens more, yeah. What did these East Germans tell you about what they were experiencing as their, as their state vanished? A state which was very challenged. It was an yeah. auto autocracy, like centrally controlled, and it was economically, yes. it was not doing well. There yes. were a lot of problems, right? What did they Lots tell you? Yes. Uh, well, in the in the spring of 1989, there were some elections, local elections, and the people wanted significant change. And they, the sentiment in the country was that the party had rigged these elections. Okay, uh, so all their candidates would win. So the government was being delegitimized. And then, of course, in Leipzig. You know, the, the protest, the Monday night protest started in Leipzig. Um, the, the intellectual class came on board very late to this process. Uh, they were intimidated, of course. Uh, and they were... It, it, so I studied the intellectual class. They, they were... The party considered them shoeshine boys or errand boys you will do what we tell you to do okay let me ask the people that you interviewed were mostly um people at universities professors yes. and teachers well, and so were, on and they, they are were, of course they get their salaries straight from yes, the state, right yes they were at universities art artists and the academy of science mm -hmm. uh, the wissenschaft uh academy der wissenschaft which was based on the russian model so they they came to the party late, October, November, when things, re well, of course, it was what, October 8th that the wall opened, I think, the e or October 9th, the, the evening of October 9th, 1989. Um, so the, the, the overall sentiment was 
that they came to realize that the party had to be reformed, the country had to be reformed, and the vast majority of them wanted a third way. Neues Forum, maybe you know that name, Neues Forum. Uh, th that was one group that was very active then. Um, and so the call for a third way was quite pronounced. Uh, but yes, there was a, a vast consensus that the GDR could not go on as it was going, as it was going. Um, economically, it was coming apart. And then ideologically, now, most of the intellectuals, the, the group of people that I interviewed, they did not want rapid unification. They wanted a third way. And so the wall opened, uh, and there was a period from that November 9th opening of the wall to the election in March, the unification election, that was the ballot question, when the intellectual class was involved in what they call roundtable, roundtable discussions. And many of them told me, oh, yes, I was going three or four nights a week. We had a real democracy. Um, we were going to reform the GDR and slowly reintegrate with West Germany. And we were going to take the best of the GDR and integrate it with the best of West Germany. That's what they thought <laughs> for that period. Now, when I got to them in September and later of the next year, they would tell me these stories and they would say, I was so naive, I was so foolish to think that that's what was going to happen. Because once that vote happened and the, the, the so-called person in the street, the common people voted overwhelmingly for immediate reunification with the West, with West Germany. Their, their East Marks would be converted at a two to one ratio. They would have money. Uh, they, would have, they, they would think they're all going to be driving fancy cars because they could watch West German television toward the end of the GDR. It was no longer blocked. Um, and um, so uh, the intellectual class was, was stunned and by the March vote. And then quickly, essentially, the GDR came to an end, although it was still formally there. But the West Germans took all the power. And so just for instance, the Academy of Science was to be, the East German Academy of Science was to be evaluated. And the evaluation panels, Wissenschaftsrat, they were going to uh, be composed of half East Germans, half West Germans. Well, that didn't happen. Uh, some of those panels were entirely West Germans. Mm -hmm. And most of them, not all of them, most of them were quite dis dismissive of the East Germans when they came to interview them. They would say things like, if you're over 40, just find another, just retire, because you're not going to get a job. Uh, if you're in what they call a, a hot subject, economics, philosophy, history, sociology, um, your chances were slim, unless you had vitamin B, yeah? Right, you know this concept, right? Health networks, good old, networks, good old yeah. Uh, uh, you're, you're in with the in crowd, mm -hmm. as we'd say in America. Uh, but they kept saying vitamin B. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, yeah, I, I forgot your original question, but they were, they were, struggling to deal with the end of their country, why socialism failed, and how am I going to support myself? And in the end, uh, one third of them were offered positions in by the West Germans, and the other two thirds were just told, Beat you got to find something else to do. Yeah. And, and these new positions were contracts, two or three year contracts. So that there was a winnowing out over time. And I couldn't find any data when I went back in 2017 to see how many of them actually survived and had careers. Now, I must say, there were some who had colleagues in the West that they knew and they fared well. 
most of them did not. Most of them were treated as second class citizens. Um, and the, the, the ones who did become academics, one even said to me, he said, he said, if I had it to do over again, I would have given up the academic life because I've been treated like a second class citizen and moved from institute or university to university for 25 years. And he said, that's no, and then passed over. So you actually found that a lot of them were re were feeling mistreated, but yet how, what, what about their perceptions of the GDR? I mean, were at the yes. time, were a lot of them regretting that this is what ha what's happening or were they actually saying like, okay, um, this is necessary? Not necessary. They understood it. I think because they had been, they either were Marxist, not all of them were Marxist. There are even some religious people I found at the Academy of Science, which would have surprised the West Germans greatly. Um, but they had this understanding of historical processes that most like Americans just don't have. I mean, it's just not here. Um, and they said they would say things like, we understand what has happened. We understand that the GDR was not doing well. Um, so one history professor who was quite well known when I walked into his office, he said, I want you to know two things. Mm -hmm. One is you have just invaded Iraq because it was 1991 and I'm adamantly opposed to that. And then he said, the other thing is you won, capitalism won, and socialism failed, but capitalism is a very deeply flawed system. And so we had a little joke. Uh, we talked about, uh, you remember Cho An Lai, you know that that name? Mm -hmm. He was Mao Zedong's, uh, he was like- uh, a Cho An Lai, a, yeah. A, a, Cho An Lai. So supposedly when Nixon went to, to China back in 72, uh, the Amer some Americans, uh, new, uh, media people were interviewing Cho An Lai. He was a very philosophical man. And they said, well, Mr. Cho An Lai, uh, what do you think of democracy? And he said, it's too early to, to, to tell. <laughs> so uh, this is what this professor told me. Uh, it's, uh, he said, I... I don't think we're at the end of history because that book was, that article Huge. had been written. The, the book hadn't come out yet, but the article was everywhere. Um, and we had a good discussion. So that was pretty much their view. Like, we don't know why this happened. We thought we were going to win and we didn't, but we don't like capitalism. We're, they were deeply skeptical of it. And of course, in their dealings with the West Germans, they were finding that uh, they were going to be treated, they were going to be opgevickled, they were going to be unwound, liquidated. Um, and, okay. but, but they weren't whiny, they were dejected and depressed, but they were philosophical, even stoic about it. Um, and they really were struggling with two things, one is, what does it mean to be German? And uh, why did socialism fail? Mm. So I started asking them this question, what country are you a citizen of? And almost all of them said, I don't know. Back I think in, I'm in, in 1990, yeah, in, in, yeah, in, in 1990-91. Yeah, well, when I asked them that in 2014, they said, I'm a German and I'm a former citizen of the GDR residing mm -hmm. in the Bundesrepublik, things like that, they would say to me. So, and I don't know if I'm jumping ahead, but just this is connected to why so many East Germans now support Russia and are critical of the war in Ukraine and are beginning to either support the AfD or are beginning to support Sarah Wagen, Wagenknecht's new party. I think it's called the Party of Sarah Wagenknecht. I think that's yeah, yeah. What, what they're calling it. Very, <laughs> very unfortunate naming, but um, yeah, uh, party. But okay, but you know, not just that. And yes, we're jumping ahead, but I need to go there now. So uh, also during Corona, the biggest 
demonstrations against the state power to crack down on individual rights. Yeah. I was in East Germany in Leipzig, yeah. the same Monday, Monday yeah. marches. So mm -hmm. the, the East Germans, even today, they still have a different ethos of thinking about power relations and actually something that you heard a lot from critics, especially of the of Corona polit uh, um, politics coming down, was in East Germany saying like, we've seen this before. We've yes. had these, we, we've, we've seen these people messaging one thing and we see on the street a completely different thing. We've seen it before and we don't like it. <laughs> and so, yes. Well, se a... several of them said to me things like, you Westerners are so naive, you're being propagated. This was in 1990, 91. You are being propagandized and you don't even realize it. And one fellow who, who I really liked, Hans Peter, he, I said, well, tell me more. And he said, well, it's so obvious to us because we knew we were being propagandized. And we developed this antenna to sense it. And you you Westerners are so gullible and you believe these things. And so here we are today, Putin is evil. Uh, I, I know very few people here in America I can have a conversation with about Russia. Mm -hmm. You know, they'll, they'll start off by saying, well, of course that Putin's a murderer and a liar and blah, 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 blah. I even had someone say to me, well, you're Polish. You're supposed to hate the Russians. What's wrong with you? You know, you're supposed you're supposed yeah, to be this according Polish, to our yeah. model of the world. Mm. <laughs> yeah, um, but He's... but the East Germans were uh, quite sensitive propaganda. Uh, well, there's one more thing: when they were around West Germans, they were very deferential and very awkward. I had one friend; she was very, very strong personality, very opinionated, very smart. And when I took her to the Wissenschaftszentrum in West Berlin, she had a personality transformation. She became like a mouse, and it was it was sad to see. Um, but they were, I don't know, I, I, I'm not condemning anyone, of course, but they knew that they were under the power of the West Germans, and that they were. They're that very, they had to behave. They had to behave. They had to behave. Yeah. According to what they thought West Germany wanted them to do, which yes. actually is not very wrong. It's yeah. Yeah. And and one fellow shouted at me, Sie müssen jetzt anpassen, you know, <laughs> you have to adapt. And um I think that's what he said to me. Was that right? That sound right? Yeah, yeah he, you have to adapt, yes. Yeah, you okay. <laughs> so um, but I I mean I I found them fascinating and interesting and uh, uh, stoic. And when I went back, I, I found them, uh, you know, they all said to a person, uh, I said, would you want to go back to the GDR? No. Do you miss the GDR? We miss solidarity. We miss our friends. Uh, we had something special there. And they would list the things that the GDR had in fact contributed to West Germany, but the West Germans wouldn't acknowledge. This was a very sore point for them. And uh, they would say, uh, capitalism is in trouble. This is in 2014 when I went back. Uh, so none of them were, none of them said, oh, it's the best thing that ever happened to me. Uh, it was like, well, this happened to me. And also they discovered a sense of identity with East Germany that they didn't know they had until East Germany came to an end. Mm -hmm. and, and, and yeah, go ahead. Yeah, and just just also to say, like East Germany as a state had some very very nasty uh, uh, institutions, you know, like spying. Yes. Uh, the, yes. the, the constant spying on individuals and like the state repression and forbidding yes. from publishing. I mean, this is this this conversation is not to mean that the GDR was that wonderful thing, but what you are saying is that is that to intellectuals and, and everyday people, they attached also important feelings. And it is true, you yes. know. A lot yes. of Germans forget that the first German in space was an East German. I mean, even mm -hmm. today, like the history of East Germany yeah. is basically is basically not perceived at all as German, mm -hmm. common German history. Right. So and this this still creates bitter feelings to this yeah. day. Yeah. So there are some some subtleties about 
scientific life in East Germany. Some of the institutes at the Academy of Science were run like mil the military. Hmm. Authoritarians were appointed. Um, and a few of them actually were based upon uh, what you could say universal norms of scientific inquiry. And the academy was more or less left to itself as long as they kept their discussions inside the walls. Mm -hmm. Nothing public. Uh, and I, there were people who told me they switched their area of expertise because it might, the one they were working on might become of interest to the Stasi and they didn't want to. Uh, work for the Stasi. There was one fellow. The state police, the state. Yeah. Those, those who were the Stasi. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, one fellow, I became quite friendly with him. He never told me he was a Stasi informer, but I'm positive he was because he said, I did terrible things. He said, they take your soul. Uh, they make you do things or you don't have a career. And, and there were, every institute had multiple Stasi spies in it. Yeah. They did. Uh, th that was true. Um, but there was a, a variance, I'm convinced, from, from institute to institute to how much freedom scholars actually had um, to pursue studies. But yes, I mean, one told me, he said, oh, my, my institute director wrote a report and they made him get out of bed and changed the report because there was something in it that uh, an official of the GDR who's going to read the report might find offensive. So he had to change it. Um, and, and there were lots of stories I got about things like that, about the repression uh, and the, well, I actually interviewed a Stasi, <laughs> a Stasi agent um, and you know, he, he said, well, we had to control the people. And, and uh, he, he said, I'm not proud of everything I did. I did some things that hurt people. He wouldn't tell me what they were. Um, but his idea was, well, you had to, you had to keep the society protected. And of course, when the Stasi files opened, lots of people wanted to go and see who was spying, who was reporting on them. Yeah.